Good morning, all. My name is John Keough. I'm a partner with the law firm Clyde & Co. based here in New York. I uh, co-head the firm's North American practice on shipping, trading, and energy. We've got a distinguished panel of market leaders uh, today to address the key issues looming as January 2020 approaches for implementation of the IMO regulations. Uh, market disruption, charter negotiations, pricing changes, accidents waiting to happen. These are all issues that the industry is focusing on and these panelists are keenly knowledgeable about. Uh, just a brief introduction to my immediate left is Andreas Hadjipetru, Managing Director of Columbia Ship Management. To his left is John Larice, Technical Liaison Manager for ExxonMobil Marine Fuels. Next to John is Hamish Norton, President Starbolt Carriers Limited. And next to Hamish is Kevin Humphreys, General Manager of Merchant Gas Carrier Sales for Wartzilla. Uh, unfortunately, Kathy Metcalf of the Chamber of Shipping of Americas unable to join us this morning due to a last minute emergency. I'd like to kick this off by directing our, uh, the first question to John uh, at ExxonMobil. John, what are you seeing now in terms of the transition to new fuels? Has it started? Is it, are we there now? Is, is time up? And, uh, and what surprises are you seeing? Uh, thanks, John. I think we all realize that the, the time's up. You know, the, the clock's been ticking for a couple of years now, and if vessel operators and charterers haven't made their plans now, they're in deep trouble. We're starting to deliver some of our .5 fuel globally. We see others doing the same thing, and we see ship operators uh, coming up with their game plan and how they're going to change over uh, their vessels. And again, whether it's tank manual tank cleaning, uh, chemical usage, flushing, gas oil usage, um, they're in the process of starting that changeover. And again, if you look at the logistics and the supply chain, we have to start earlier as a supplier to change over our, our either our blending or our refining process, clean our shore tanks, get our barges cleaned before we can even make those deliveries, and then the ship operators are, have to do the same thing. So I think we are just starting to see the, the changeover now, and it'll continue to ramp up right up to the January 1st deadline. Hamish, uh, are you seeing sufficient availability of fuel in, in your part of the business, in the ports that uh, you expect to be taking on fuel? Well, okay, you know, just to, to provide some background to that question, Starbulk is putting scrubbers on the vast majority of its fleet, uh, almost all the ships. So. The fuel we're going to be looking for is um, heavy fuel oil. And globally, we think that there will be a lot of heavy fuel oil available. It certainly won't be in shortage. Um, it may be hard to find in small ports which have to make a decision whether to supply high sulfur or low sulfur fuel and cannot supply both. Uh, but in large ports, we think it will be straightforwardly available, and the impact on us and other shipping companies that need heavy fuel oil is probably a little bit extra working capital tied up in fuel. We'll probably fill our tanks a bit more full than we otherwise would so that we're not forced to try to find fuel in small ports. Thank you. Andreas, uh, what surprises are you seeing? How prepared is the industry uh, the ship operators and the owners uh, for the transition. A few months ago, everybody was a bit concerned that it's very difficult to adopt, it's very difficult to, to go through the transition period and so on. Whereas now, as we move closer to the uh, 2020 deadline, we see that the emotions are somehow gone and the people are preparing for the transition. Our role as a technical manager is to accommodate the wishes of the commercial operators and the owners that, uh, that we work for, 
And we have seen, uh, we have a number of clients, which is about 88% 8, 8 of our fleet, that they follow the Starbuck um, approach of feeding scrubbers. But then the vast majority is um, uh, basically they are not uh, willing to, to install scrubbers and uh, invest uh, in, the, in, in the scrubber system. So what we are obviously doing is we are ensuring that the crew has been prepared, the uh, ship implementation plans are in place, and we cooperate very closely with the uh, commercial operators to make sure that the transition is as smooth as possible. What we clearly see is that um, the vast majority of the uh, commercial operators, they are delaying the switch to the low uh, sulfur fuel as long as possible. And I think a challenge we will all have is, uh, let's say, 20th or 15th of December, when immediately somebody, everybody will try to switch so that they are ready by the 20, uh, 31st December. So I, I think it's more of a timing issue rather than preparation issue. Kevin, from a Wartzilla perspective, uh, tell us what you're seeing with respect to installs. Are, are, how are those uh, matching your expectations? When I was asked that question, I think, at this panel uh, earlier this year in the, the spring, early summer, we, we were anticipating about 2,200 installs globally with a fudge factor in the, in the low hundreds. And, and the reason I say fudge factors, are there was manufacturers coming online that we were unaware of and, and weren't reported. Now we're looking at about 32, 30, 300 installed units, uh, either installed or on order, and then a, a larger fudge factor because a, a, a very large group of uh, new manufacturers came online that we had not, uh, weren't aware of and, and weren't anticipating. So we're looking in the high 3000s total installed or, or on order units. Uh, just one, when, when you think about those, just one, one caveat is remember a cruise ship, for example, has five installs. So, so you, when you're looking at numbers, make sure you're looking at vessels uh, or, or installed units. Those are, those are two different things. Um, the, the surge that we anticipated dropping very rapidly at the beginning of the year is going to stretch out quite a bit longer. Um, at the numbers we were anticipating earlier in the year, it was about six installs a day for the industry. Um, and now that number is somewhere in the range of, of say, nine to 10 installs a day. And that's, that's, that's impossible to happen by the end of the year. So this is going to extend out this, this initial phase in period, certainly through Q1, probably well, well into, if not through Q2. Um, and then continue on, because you see more, menu, or more owners uh, now making that decision as well, putting orders in. And so when our order book is already booked out 15 to 18 months um, to get a slot, um, that's the kind of time frames you're looking at if you're, if you're coming into the market now. What, what effect, if any, have you seen from port restrictions on scrubbers on your install business? Uh, as far as the, the restrictions on open loop, um, n not much. Uh, if, if any, uh, every owner I spoke to in the, you know, the two years leading up to the, the heavy ordering phase had assumed those kinds of restrictions would come into place, um, either or A or B, they, they burned such little percentage of the fuel in port that, that it was not uh, a primary economic concern. So, so their, their calculations of the investment were run in, in open ocean operation. If they were going to run heavy fuel in port, it was gravy. But if that was restricted, that was not uh, not an issue for them. So we haven't seen any cancellations or or uh, a big shift as a result of these port restrictions. John, fuel availability for the uh, the new fuels. Uh, what are you seeing out there now? We've started producing, but again, Exxon Mobil is in all global locations. I think uh, Hamish made a good point that we get into some smaller ports and you may have some issues with availability of not only the, the high sulfur, but also maybe compliant fuel. And for those vessels that don't have any other options, they may be forced uh, into a gas oil uh, type solution. So I think as we get closer to January 1st, it'll kind of play out on where we're seeing the availability, where we're gonna have issues. And again, it comes back to Hamish's point when he talked about um, you know, having to bunker in certain locations where typically you wouldn't in a big port, um, using a little more capital, it really comes back to it's not a game anymore of fuel procurement, it's fuel management. And again, it's manage how you buy, how you um, set up your, your vessel, where you're going to purchase, 
uh, what type of, of fuel, and looking at more longer term solutions and, and maybe term deals to um, lock in those uh, molecules in the ports that your vessels are going, I think is going to be really, really key for operators to ensure they have a steady supply of the proper fuel they need. Hamish, are you seeing any, any incidents uh, with your scrubbers in terms of performance uh, with the scrubbers on your vessels? Any uh, unexpected matters coming up in that regard? Um, you know, we, we've obviously heard of incidents where scrubbers have had, um, in some cases, dramatic failures. We think those are pretty rare. Uh, we haven't had any such issues on our own uh, scrubber installations. Um, how do you manage those risks? How do we manage those risks? We, uh, you know, we, I hope we have good people doing installation engineering and installation, <laughs> and, um, you know, hopefully people are checking each other's work and not making mistakes. Um, you know, we, we find that it takes some time to dial in the performance of a scrubber once it's installed and, and get it commissioned. Um, and, you know, we, we, we see that, that some uh, brands of scrubber commission more quickly than others, but we haven't had any, any major problems. Um, it, it just, you know, takes a little bit of time and, um, and once they're commissioned, they work well. And uh, we're running uh, a number of our ships uh, with the scrubbers going full time. I, I think it's at this point in excess of 30 ships with the scrubbers just running um, all the time, just to make sure we understand their performance. Andreas, uh, what are the practical issues you see in implementing uh, operations, compliance, Okay, if I, if I start from where uh, Hamish uh, has uh, finished on the testing and making sure that the systems are operated. O on our scrubber fit ships, uh, what has been important was that we knew that the ships would be delivered with scrubbers, these are new builds primarily, and therefore we had enough time f to train the crew to make sure that uh, the preparation is there and the people know how to operate the systems. What we have experienced, however, is teething problems with uh, the, the usage of the, of the scrubbers, and, and I think this relates to the, on the one hand, to the quality of the equipment, uh, and at the other, on the other hand, the fact that there are not so many scrubbers fitted, so therefore, you know, the, the, the uh, problems which uh, uh, pop up sometimes are for the first time. Therefore, this is attended with the manufacturers of scrubbers and so on. Now, with regards to the ships that they are not uh, planned uh, with scrubbers, obviously the whole process is, is more structured because it's, you have a lot more ships actually which are not fitted with uh, scrubbers and then you need to make sure that the crew has been trained, that the, the ship implementation uh, plan is in place and it's been communicated and that, and that you obviously uh, connect with your charterers to make sure that the changeover plan is being agreed with them. Uh, therefore, the risks are primarily connected with the non-coordination. As long as you are coordinated and then you know uh, what the plan is, then, you, are, then you, you should be fine. Of course, we are in shipping and we know that the, the ships can trade anywhere. So on our um, ships on a liner service, is much more easier, whereas the ships in, in spot, obviously it's more challenging and because you don't know what the ship is going to be. How many ships in your fleet approximately and how many are being fitted with scrubbers and how many are not, would you say? We've got 300 ships in our uh, fleet and uh, we have about 15 ships that they have been delivered with scrubbers. So these are new builds and we have a client, a major client who has a, a retrofit plan. So we, we expect about 8% of the fleet, which is reflected to about 25 ships to be uh, scrap feed by next year. Kevin, uh, with, with uh, January 2020 essentially on us now, what does Wartzilla see for the next step beyond that? What are the issues you're seeing? 
the, the conversation we're having now really is, is beyond scrubbers. I, I mean, 2020, it, it, it will come, it will pass, you know, Y2K type, type thing. And, and so the next conversation we're having is how do we handle 2030, 2050? Um, how do we design and build ships that are future-proofed? I'm going to be ordering in a few years to recapitalize once I, I've, I've got capital to work with again. Uh, market conditions are better. How, how do I make sure that vessel is, is going to be able to perform with what is still somewhat a, an unknown IMO regulation that's going to be coming in? I, I don't want a vessel that's already outdated three years into its life cycle. So that's the, 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 the next conversation is how do we comply? How do we design and build ships that, that, that are future-proof for 2030, 2050 uh, greenhouse gas emission targets? Hamish. What are you seeing in terms of the risks in the, uh, in, in, in the business, chartering vessels as against, as versus not chartering vessels with scrubbers on board? What are the challenges you see in that respect? Well, I, you know, I, I, I think, f f first of all, uh, our stated goal, and uh, I think we'll come pretty close to achieving it, is to voyage charter as much of our fleet as possible in 2020 uh, so that we don't have to negotiate time charter contracts involving ships with scrubbers, um, which is a very tricky negotiation. Um, what makes that so tricky? Um, basically, the charterer pays for the fuel, and so the scrubber is saving the charterer money directly um, and the owner is trying to get some of the benefit that the charterer is receiving for the owner's uh, account. Um, and that introduces huge complexity because, for example, what do you do if the scrubber goes out of commission and the ship is burning, therefore, uh, marine gas oil that maybe the charterer never purchased? Um, or, um, you know, let's say that the charterer is giving the owner the full scrubber benefit in theory. Um, uh, that's still not as good as a voyage charter because if the owner, if the charterer is giving the owner the full scrubber benefit, that means that the charterer is effectively paying for compliant high cost fuel and running the ship slower than would be optimal if the ship were, you know, set at its optimal speed burning heavy fuel oil. And so the total profit split between the owner and the charterer is reduced. Um, you know, basically what I would recommend is anybody who's negotiating a charter um, on a ship, a time charter on a ship with a scrubber, get a very good and experienced lawyer who's thought deeply about these issues. I'm all for she that. like that. I'm all for that. <laughs> <laughs> Great answer. <laughs> John Larice at, at ExxonMobil, what are, you, what are you seeing in terms of the, uh, the compatibility of the new fuels uh, for mixing, and, and what issues do you see arising in that regard, if any? You know, when we started this process a couple of years ago, we've identified that there was a number of issues with the new fuels. It's, it's not as simple as just taking the resid of today and adding some distillate to, to dilute the, the sulfur. I mean, if you look at the fuels today, you take resid off a tower, and what we do is we blend for viscosity or density, right? So the, the sulfur limit today is 3.5% globally, but the sulfur average is about 2.5%. So we see issues with how different suppliers are going to blend down to make that work, and you'll see different compositions of, of fuel. It's not gonna be the same as what we see today. So the problem is, is when ships go from port to port to port, they're not always bunkering the same type of fuel. And you know, very, very simply, if you say you've got a very aromatic fuel or you've got a very paraffinic fuel, the two of them don't mix, and it can create problems on board. The other issue is, is if you look at the ISO specs on how fuel is purchased, there is no compatibility. You've got a stability, you've got a sediment, but it's really up to the vessel operator to ensure that they keep those fuels segregated. Mm -hmm. And in some cases, it's very, very difficult to segregate fuel on board a ship. You know, certain ships, whether it's potentially a bulker or a tanker, would only have, say, two storage tanks. 
And you may not be able to separate those two fuels. And again, as you complicate the matters and you have a charterer who buys the fuel and then the vessel has to manage the fuel, they may create problems with loading on top and compatibility. So I, I sincerely hope I'm wrong and we don't see the problems, um, but I do think we are going to see an increased uh, number of claims, number of issues with vessels, um, and not being able to segregate fuel, buying fuel from different locations. It's a very significantly different type of fuel, and there's compatibility issues where we see purifier sludging and, and filter blockage and, and issues on board. So I think it is a real issue. Um, it's been identified within the industry. You know, the new PAS was released. The joint industry guidance um, has been released. Um, and they all warn the industry, whether it's a vessel operator or suppliers, to, to be very careful. And again, this comes back to fuel management versus just procurement. So when your bunker buyers are, are buying the fuel, they need to know what they're buying. Is it aromatic? Is it paraffinic? And get that type of information to vessel operators. You know, some of the other issues, again, whether it's a combustion issue, um, whether it's a waxing issue with the lower viscosity, all these things are very, very critical in, in addition to um, just the compatibility. So it's, it's a, it really a whole new ball game out there. Are you see, seeing any uh, limited availability on the horizon in any geographic regions? I so think, far. like Hamish said, in, in smaller ports, you may not have the ability um, for different types of fuel. And again, whether, you know, smaller ports, you've got a supplier who maybe have one or two shore tanks, he may not want to put one tank into a high sulfur service for only, you know, 10% of the supply, and it may not be available. So again, pre-planning your vessel routes and where you can get fuel and, and that type of thing is very, very important to really make sure you're operating your vessel as, as financially, you know, economic as you can. Andreas, uh, looking past January 2020 as a manager, uh, is there a role that big data analytics play for you and your business managing these risks? Well, in connection to 2020, I wouldn't say that big data plays an important role. Um, based on, and I have to agree with what John said, segregation of the tanks and so on is important, and it would apply maybe for 90% of the fleet. Um, but uh, moving, moving towards the data analytics uh, subject and so on, I think it's not really managing risks. It's more towards optimizing, towards finding solutions for uh, the ship owners to, to optimize the performance of the fleet. Obviously, there are a number of um, uh, available products in the market, and they refer to uh, main engine optimization, auxiliary engine optimization, boilers, and so on. Uh, what we have developed on our company, we created together with uh, partners Todoteo from Cyprus, we have developed a performance optimization control room, which is based on a technology which uh, we receive the big data from the ship. And when I say big data, it can be sensors, it can be uh, flow meters whatsoever, but it can also be a very analytical position reporting from the ship, which is then tested with uh, satellites and uh, AIS data for correctness. And with this data, you basically provide to the uh, ship owner the assurance that the voyage plan has been followed and it's been optimized. Because it's one thing what you can do after the event and one thing you can do before the event. And through analytics and obviously what is also new in our industry is that um, with all this data, you can actually design the trends, you can see the performance, where it goes, you can take corrective actions. So I see that for then non-scrapper fit ships, but also for the scrapper fit ships, the, the future as well will not be, uh, it will lead to some extent to the usage of, of the data. Having said that, I need to confess something that I think everybody knows that we're experiencing nowadays, the, the spike in the tanker market. Is a ship with uh, big data availability earning more money? This we have to see, but I think it's more optimizing your costs 
and making sure that, uh, that you capitalize from whatever you can capitalize. Kevin, from Wartzilla's perspective, any surprises with the onset of January that, that you're seeing that are going to carry through into 2020 uh, with scrubbers? I mean, no huge surprises. I, I mean, uh, regulatory uh, compliance that's equipment-led is, is not a new phenomenon. And so some of the things we're seeing play out in the industry is what we should have expected. We should have expected a number of new manufacturers coming in. Uh, but uh, by the same token, I, I think uh, history has shown us when that happens, when you have manufacturers rushing into a fill of space for regulatory compliance, is down the road you end up with compliance issues. Um, and certainly, uh, one of one of my concerns is 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 the quality of the equipment going out uh, once we get past this sort of initial phase, six months or so of the, of the new regulations. Are are you going to start seeing? issues with uh, performance reliability where you end up getting, you know, port state control, uh, seizing or finding vessels for non-compliance. Uh, we know from, from our, our side as, as an OEM, we're, we're very uh, particular about the electronic lock boxes on our equipment. So the performance characteristics are not alterable by the crew and they're available to regulatory agencies. I, I would certainly have some concern if I was operating equipment without that, 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 that you may see that creep up as Port State enforces more and more and more. It gets past the initial phase of switch over into to enforcement. So I, I think it shouldn't be a surprise, but I, I, I suspect, and unfortunately, I think we're going to see some of that in the later half of 20. Hamish, any, any, any surprises you see now, say, with the use of chemicals uh, or, or in any other regard that, that mm -hmm. you didn't quite expect yeah. with the onset of January 2020. Well, uh, you know, I, I guess I, I was expecting that the demand for compliant fuel would be greater at this date than it is, in fact, today. Um, and it seems that the reason that the demand for compliant fuel isn't quite as high as I had previously expected is that uh, ship owners are using um, you, basically, the chemicals that you put in your bunker tank to suspend the sludge and, and get that sludge flowing through the engine, basically, in advance of switching over to compliant fuel, those chemicals seem to work better than I had expected that they would work. And so people are planning a switchover a little bit later in the year than I had originally expected. Uh, which is fine. I mean, I, I think, uh, you know, people who, who are, uh, you know, making these plans intelligently are, are I think, well prepared. It's just, uh, it's going to take less time for those people to switch over than, than uh, I, had, I had thought. Um, and, um, you know, that, that probably makes the switch over a little bit easier, frankly. Because if you switch over to compliant fuel before year end, again, there are difficult discussions with time charters about whether or not they should pay for that more expensive fuel, you know, or not. Thank you. We have just a few minutes left. If there are any questions uh, from the audience, we can take a few questions. Yes. If you look at typically how we formulate the fuels, you're getting away at having less residual in there and more distillate. And typically, if you look at the energy content, you'll have more energy in a distillate than you would in, in a residual. So in my personal opinion, and, and again, nothing based on fact, but just looking at historically what I think is going to happen within the industry, I think you'll actually get a, a higher energy content uh, of the fuels, average fuels going forward. Anyone else? Yes, sir. What are the major maintenance issues for scrubbers, and uh, uh, is there a, a, a planned maintenance program that uh, Wurzela, for example, recommends, and how much does this add to the OPEX? 
Scrubber operation is relatively simple, uh, and there, there's not a whole lot of moving parts to the scrubber itself. Um, if, if you have, for example, wash equipment, which, which we recommend, um, which takes out some of the particulates and PAHs, um, that needs routine maintenance. But it's, it's relatively minor and nothing outside the normal scope of a ship operation. I mean, these are overall fairly simple, uh, conceptually pieces of equipment. I mean, there are pumps and there are uh, sulfur and turbidity sensors and, you know, the pumps uh, have a, a routine maintenance schedule, but it's, it's pretty infrequent uh, and they last for years. And the, the sulfur sensors, um, you know, go bad now and then and you need to have some spare parts. But, uh, you know, hopefully they don't go bad too often. Yeah. I mean, if, if you're running in a specialty area with closed loop, that's a different story, but that's a really small sliver of the, the scrubber market. Um, but for, for most of you uh, operating open loop, it's relatively routine. If I may add, Kevin clearly has a better experience on me on, on the on the Varsila scrubbers, but overall we estimate that if a, if a ship is scrubber fit, we will have higher OPEX. And this, these are calculated from anywhere from twenty to $100,000 per year. Yes. For, for John who, or whoever else wants to comment, with regard to the availability of the 0 0.5 fuel, you mentioned how there may be some problems in smaller ports. And I'm wondering if that is, is more of a function of uh, uh, the preparation issues of the smaller ports or more of a function of uh, refineries worldwide delivering enough of the 0 0.5 fuel? I think it's probably more preparation as uh, I think Hamish has commented whether it's due to the the maintenance chemicals we're having vessel operators change over later so there may not be demand you know in the major ports you already see start some of the deliveries but there may not be demand in those smaller ports for the 0.5 so it may not be to the last minute that you see those smaller ports uh, have the 0.5 available, be just because there's the, there's no demand in those uh, smaller ports. I think there's one other question here. What happened? Last question. What happens if a scrubber goes out mid-voyage? Well, if if a scrubber goes out mid-voyage, then you know you switch over to compliant fuel, and uh, you know our typ typical ship will have five or six bunker tanks. And today, you know, we have marine gas oil in one or more tanks. And, you know, come 2020, we'll have marine gas oil probably in one or more tanks, and we'll be able to switch over. Yeah. Thanks very much to our panel, and thank you for your patience listening. Thank you. Thank you.